join me for a conversation with transmedia author and speaker, Houston Howard. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Matt and I am your host, this is the podcast where we learn how to become better game masters and role players by filling ourselves with stories and knowledge. All right, guys, I have an amazing interview coming right up. But first, if you could like, rate, review, or subscribe to the podcast wherever you are listening to it, I would greatly, greatly appreciate that. Those things help the show immensely. So please just uh, click those buttons, hit the five stars, whatever you got there. <laughs> got to slip that one in, right? Always five stars, always five stars. But anyway, um, if you could do one of those things, it would be awesome. Uh, I really, really do appreciate it. I know I say it all the time, but it is uh, very helpful when I see reviews and ratings come in on the podcast. It just lets me know that I should keep making these episodes. All right, guys, with all of that stuff out of the way, let's just jump into the interview today. My guest today is transmedia author and speaker, Houston Howard. Houston, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Now, I first became aware of you and your work through the YouTube channel Film Courage. Uh, you have done a series of interviews for them, and you're talking about Hollywood and your involvement in film and television. And you mentioned a few little key words that always makes me uh, perk up a bit. And you said you played tabletop role-playing games. <laughs> and yes, so, uh, yeah. And so I was, I heard you say that and I was like, oh my gosh, I got to reach out to Houston. So why don't you just start off? When did you first learn about tabletop role-playing games and start uh, rolling dice? Man, it was uh, probably back in, I would say middle school, seventh eighth grade uh so this was this would be back in like the the early 90s and um one of my friends uh invited me over and uh wanted me to play D D. and this was the old like tsr version of D D. and uh and i'd never never i mean i'd heard of D D before never played a role-playing game before um we started playing it was okay honestly uh uh i didn't i didn't love it at first because it was uh, the people that I was playing with were were good guys, but it just seemed like it was ninety uh, percent of the game was uh, trying to figure out the rules and arguing about the rules, and was just so it was you know just it was just a lot of rule mongering. And uh, but that was my first experience. Played a few games uh, with them, but then my world really got expanded. Uh, you know, growing up as a as a child of the of the eighties and nineties. Um, uh, you know, I'm a big Star Wars fan, and my world really just exploded. When um, I was introduced to um, the the old West End Games D six uh, Star Wars RPG, and um, that I just latched onto immediately, and uh, uh, found a group of guys that um, that uh, that were great storytellers and just fun guys to hang out with, and we we started uh, we started playing that, and and honestly, you know I I attribute 90% of my professional storytelling ability, especially in the area of transmedia and world building and everything in between to the thousands of hours of, of, of RPGs that, uh, that I played, uh, you know, in my youth and still play today. Okay. And we'll get into, uh, a lot of all of that stuff, but of, of course, I do want to follow up with uh, the Star Wars, uh, West End games was one of my favorite systems of all time. Um, yeah. and, and you, you're kind of right um, that there was a little period of time when D and D was very hard to get into. Kind of, um, yeah. uh, even though I loved it and I would play occasionally with, you know, not any thought to what the actual rules were. Hardly, um, um, sure. you know. But the Star Wars West End games, you know, all of my friends, you know, were Star Wars fans. 
And yeah. then I could explain the rules in like 10, 15 minutes. We can make a character yep. in 10 or 15 minutes. So in a half hour, we're in and playing, right? And so um, that game was just phenomenal. Of course, I, I, it's been my pleasure to interview uh, Bill Slavasek on the podcast and nice. Peter Corliss, uh, who who all had their hand in it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, of course, Bill wrote the the source book, <laughs> you know, which sure. was, which, uh, was uh, essential. You had your uh, you had your basic rules and then you had the source book, um, yeah. which was incredible. And so, um, yeah, I have, I could not tell you. You said thousands of hours. I could not tell you how many hours I played uh, the Star Wars West End games because it was just so much. Um, and so that is really cool that uh, that you discovered that, and it, it was um, you know kind of your entry into uh, into this world of you know role playing games because I, I found it to be a great. Uh, tool to to kind of onboard friends, especially during a certain period. Now, five E, absolutely. Is, you know, five E is the a great onboarding tool now. But like during the nineties, sure. you know, that was e- easy to onboard people and get them to discover the love of role playing games. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And you know, and and at the time, um, you know, this was uh, you know we, we were that that was the only Star Wars we had, right? Yep. Other than yep. the original films, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we were, we were Star Wars starved. Uh, this yep. is before the re-release of the trilogy, of the original trilogy, and definitely before the, the prequel trilogy come out. And so uh, when I was, when I was introduced to this, this was able to fill that gap for me of, of new Star Wars stuff. And yep. it was, it was this revelatory moment. I, I'll, I'll never forget it when, uh, cause you know, again, I never really played role-playing games before. And when they, when, when I sat down, um, to, to make my first character, uh, the, the, the game master, um, uh, said, okay, you know, who do you want to do, who you want to be? And, and I said, uh, I want to be Luke Skywalker. <laughs> and he said, he said, you can't be Luke Skywalker. And I said, well, why? And he said, cause Luke Skywalker is Luke Skywalker. Uh, you, you gotta, you gotta be somebody new. And, 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 and that, at that moment I was like, oh, Okay, so not not only do I get new Star Wars stuff, but now I actually get to be in Star Wars in, in, in this really interesting way, and and it just really you know clicked with me in, in, in a big way. And then I actually you know found myself um, uh, probably soon, pretty pretty quickly, uh, just assuming that role of game master. And I I, I probably was I was the primary 90 percent of the time was the gm for for uh uh for me and my buddies and um and that was it was just great it was it was, it was, it was a great tool i then moved on to you know expanded my my rpg world uh mm-hmm. during my high school and college years into um uh the gurps system uh playing Gur- gurp supers uh specifically uh had some epic superhero campaigns with gurps um played a little cyberpunk uh did, did a few things like that but really like gurp supers Star Wars were my go-to and, um, and, uh, just had, you know, and, and I had the benefit of just, um, having a really good group of friends that were just funny and engaging and, uh, great storytellers themselves. We tried to, to, to branch out into some white wolf stuff at some point, um, uh, and, uh, uh specifically Wraith the Oblivion and, um, uh, which I thought was a really intriguing, uh, this universe that they had, but it was very moody and dark and as everything in, in, in the world of darkness is uh, obviously, but um, inevitably every game we would play would just end in just us just laughing hysterically and being, and, and it was just so stupid and crazy. We just ruined the mood of all of our, all the white wolf games. <laughs> so we just always reverted back to our superheroes and star Wars stuff just so we could have fun and laugh. But um but yeah, I, I, I really attribute so much to my uh, to my RPG days. Uh, and then when I was in college, actually, um, uh, me and me and one of my my good friends, we uh, we created our own uh, role playing system, and we actually created a professional wrestling uh, uh, RPG that um, that I was I'm still just completely sold on the fact that it was it was one of the the most fun RPGs that that people have never played. Uh, there was it was before the days of self publishing and couldn't really get the publishers, but we created this epic professional role playing system that I will go to the grave with. Uh, but uh, uh, but yeah, so super super into RPGs for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And uh, I think there is a oh, I can't remember the name right now, but there is a pro wrestling RPG out that somebody self published. I, I can't remember what it's called. Oh, really? Though. Yeah. yeah. So that's interesting. Um, 
but yeah, I'm just thinking, you know, like you, you had mentioned, you know, that this had, you know, kind of informed so much of your work. And of course I'm going to get to sure. that. Um, but then you said you're still playing. So what are you playing these days? Uh, I'm still playing. I'm still, still playing this, uh, the old Star Wars system, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, just doing it, doing it over Zoom, um, mm-hmm. and it's uh, and that's been fun. And uh, still playing this, um, uh, this, this, the system that that I created in college, kind of retooling it with that, with the uh, the professional wrestling aspect of it, uh, but then broadening that to to an actual system because. Right now, I'm, I'm in heavy development with um, with me and my company and the, and the people that we have. Uh, we're internally developing a um, just really massive world building project that we're going to be developing into publishing and film and television and all these other things. And and the way I the way I like to put pressure on um, the the ideas that we have and and to really help develop the worlds uh, during the the world building development stage of, of large scale entertainment is I like to, to, to take a base system and, um, and run games in the world. And that, that ferrets out, uh, you know, holes and, uh, you know, presents new spotlights on things I never considered before. Um, and so, uh, really for the past several months, been, been actively running games in a, in a world that I'm sort of building on the fly. So, um, so it's been great. Yeah. Nice. Nice. That's really interesting. Um, and probably just my naivete at some point, but I didn't realize until really I started doing this podcast, how many uh, screenwriters, uh, directors and producers uh, have played Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you know, I, or, or the West End Star Wars game. Um, and I guess sure. that's probably because now everybody in their forties and fifties run the whole show. Right. <laughs> you sure. know, we, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. The old, the older generation who didn't, since they didn't come along until the seventies, you know, that older generation right. has moved on and now, sure. uh, yeah, everybody's, uh, everybody's fans of the old D and D cartoon or something like that. And, right. you know, and they're like, well, let's do something with role-playing games now. Sure. Yeah. Now you said, you know, um, uh, you know, you said you attribute like 90% of your storytelling and the work you do today to tabletop role-playing games. Um, Why do you say that? Why do you say 90% uh, is, you know, is it just because it's such a good medium for telling stories? It's just a great medium for selling, telling stories. And, you know, so much of storytelling is, is reps and, Mm -hmm. um, uh, you you just have to you know I you know I I grew up an athlete and played college athletics and things like that and, and and so much of athletics is just reps you know getting in the batting cage and and hitting balls or taking shots on the court or you know it's 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 just you know it's it's repetition and you get better through repetition and storytelling is the same way the way you get better at stories is to continue to tell stories whether mm-hmm. you do it in a in an RPG setting uh, whether you whether you're uh, you know you're you're writing short stories whether you're writing novels it's just actually performing the the storytelling work and using those storytelling muscles that gets you better uh especially when you're around other storytellers and and i didn't realize it at the time but when i when i mm-hmm. when i eventually got into um more you know uh, formal writing environments in in college uh, you know even into uh you know i i, I uh, graduated law school and uh, um, even in law school, the, the, the artist storytelling uh, benefited me, but I didn't realize how much those reps as a teenager and through college playing those RPGs actually helped my uh, uh, the ability to form and tell a story and uh, really understand all the different moving parts in the story that I wasn't able to identify before, but, but, but utilize just instinctively. And then also how to articulate the story just as a, you know, as a, as a public speaking exercise, Mm -hmm. there's all these different aspects uh, of of storytelling that goes into RPGs. And, you know, and I had thousands of hours of reps that, uh, that, that, then I, you know, was able to utilize. And then especially the world building aspect, I, I attribute, um, my, you know, I, I do a lot of, I do a lot of world building. I, I, I heavily consult with, uh, studios and creators and, and world building uh, for for large scale IP. I um, I teach world building at two different universities uh, in Los Angeles, and uh, so I'm very much in the world uh, building headspace. But but my world building skills really started with RPGs. I I'll never forget it uh, when I was when I uh, I was I was running a one of my first I think maybe the first game I ever ran 
mm-hmm. uh, the Star Wars uh, RPG. And um, I, you know, everything was looking back it was all so cliche. But we, we start, but we started the we started the game uh, where you know uh, yeah I had the players and they, they they started out you know they they got off their ship they landed in a spaceport they got off their ship and I needed them to go you know down the street turn left and go into the cantina that was on the left right like and and that was where somebody was waiting on them to hire them for the job you know to sort of that uh, the basic kickoff to 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 the um, to the story and uh, and I'll never forget they. They, they went down the street and instead of turning left into the cantina, they turned right. And I realized at that point, one, I couldn't control the characters, which, which that was my first realization of that. Uh, but then, but then I realized I hadn't thought about what was right. I hadn't thought about what was down that street and who lives down there. And, and uh, you know, and, and what is in that part of town? I hadn't thought of that yet. Mm-hmm. And, and so I had to, had to kind of do it all on the fly and improv but that that forced me then moving forward as a world builder to to not just you know map out where I think the story will go, but I got to map out everything just in case my players uh, are stubborn and, and and want to explore you know beyond my my guardrails that I give them, which they always do, <laughs> and uh, 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 and and so. It, it just forced me to kind of build the entire sandbox. And, um, and then when I get into now a professional environment and I'm, and I'm working with screenwriters and authors and producers and studios and things like that, uh, you know, they, they instinctively look at story through the, through the lens of narrative, through the lens of a plot, um, which, which is like a game master looking at a game through the lens of their story and I, I'm always kind of pushing their, 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 the scope of their vision of like, okay, what else is out there beyond this one story so that you can get into a, a place where you can tell more stories than just this one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And of course, I think every game master has that one session where they're like, oh, right, my players are human beings and they can right. you know, choose to go somewhere else. Because <laughs> um, exactly. I, I tell the story, too, that I, I think it was a dungeon when I was only like 10 years old and I, I expected the party to like go right first and then yeah. to go left. And of course, they just go left, right? Like they, yep, they didn't yep. go right, and so so frustrating. I know, and I think back <laughs> then I was like, "Nope, you can't," you know, <laughs> until, <laughs> you know. But until you know, I realized, of course, that it's just like, well, of course you can, uh, of course you can go that way, you know, and um, uh, you can explore those things, and I'll just make it up on the fly, and that's when my games became like I jumped, I jumped like. 10 sure. levels that day right as a game master yeah 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 i mean uh, and, and, and you know professionals are, are really dealing with this in, 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 a, in a big way in the era of vr uh, professional vr developers mm-hmm. uh because in vr you you don't control the composition of the shot uh people can look wherever they want to look yeah. and and so and so now the traditional film producer and the traditional film director are struggling in vr or mm-hmm. like metaverse type of environments uh and 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 People with with that seminal understanding of, of, of RPGs now know, okay, we can't control where they look, but let's figure out how to incentivize where we want them to look. Uh, but still, we have to make provisions for what's over in the other directions. And so a lot of these skills are now becoming heavily crossover uh, skills, especially when you get into the world of gaming, VR, and metaverse uh, content. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think one of the things that always kind of, you know, that set apart, say, a tabletop role playing game for me from a video game role playing game. Um, and now I've enjoyed a number of, of, of really good role playing games, you know, video games. Um, but, you know, you, you know, even take Skyrim, which is amazing. And sure. you go to, you know, you go and you help uh, the, you know, this one person one time. Well, you go back to them. They say the same things, right? Yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, sure. and but where the tabletop RPG, right? My players can come back and back to that same NPC and they say something different every time, right? Sure. <laughs> you know, yeah. and um, and I, I think it is interesting that we're really trying to to kind of like you were mentioning their VR and different things. We're really trying to push some of these kind of more traditional mediums of a video game, film, movie, television, whatever. We're trying to push some of those into the realm of, you know, 
of a tabletop role playing game, right? Where it's a sure. different experience wherever people look, even if they look back to the same place. You know, it's really interesting. Is uh, uh, several years ago, I um, did some work with the Disney Imagineers, and uh, uh, which was awesome. And I yeah. and I went to the the their little headquarters, which is which is super cool in, in Burbank, California. But the um, uh, working with the with with the Imagineers was really interesting because they were at that point going through a transition of of thought and philosophy of how to approach how to approach the parks. And these are the most, you know, imaginative, uh, uh, creative, smart people that you could ever imagine. And, uh, and, but they were still, you know, used to at Disneyland and Disney world, you sit in a, you sit in a chair and you go down a track and uh, that you go right when they want you to go right. And you go left when, when they want you to go left. Um, uh, but they, they, they were starting to try to figure out, okay, what if, if 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 our people could experience the story and experience the world without the track and what would that look like and and they quickly realized how mu- how radically different the storytelling becomes and and the approach to the storytelling then becomes and and they were bringing in people just to to help them with that and uh you know and when they when i uh when me and my partners uh were, were brought in um i just snapped back into rpg i said that guys this is just a one giant rpg and you just have to have to run it like a tabletop rpg and uh because you're not going to be able to control where the people go uh so you need to have jump off off points and you need to be able to incentivize them in certain directions and uh but uh but you need to create the the narrative everywhere and this it's basically one giant larp uh, with, with 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 what they needed to do and eventually we we saw that mature into what we see now with with uh, galaxy's edge and even the the avengers campus um and they're moving into this th- this large scale immersive storytelling which really again is just one giant tabletop rpg and if especially when you get into what they're doing now with the um uh the the, uh the the star wars galaxy cruiser which is like the cruise ship where you can go spend three days in 24 hour uh uh, star wars land um where you know you could your your story is all around you they're really really leaning into this this idea but it's the same idea that we've had since the you know the the inception of of of, of dnd and the development of of the tabletop RPG industry is, is really, really super interesting. Yeah. With just like uh, tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars poured into it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. absolutely. Uh, a little bit higher budget than I have at my table with my hand drawn map or whatever, but uh, it yeah. is a, you know, it is amazing um, to see that that's kind of where it goes, you know, kind of where, where the way the storytelling is going, because I, I think for, you know, at certain points in my life, when I tried to introduce some people to tabletop role playing games, you know, there was a little pushback and they're like, well, I don't get it. You know, what do you mean? I don't pass go and collect $200 or whatever. Right, sure. And, you know, sure. they were had a board game kind of mindset, but we're really, uh, you know, really, I think, I guess, you know, people are just becoming more and more accustomed to this idea of, well, I can walk into the space and I can move 360 degrees and interact with a piece of the story. And that's going to maybe lead me to something bigger, but maybe it won't, maybe it'll just lead me down a little side kind of alley for a little while. And then I'll look back and it'll be like, well, that was fun anyway. Right? Like I didn't even do the main part, but who cares? It was a ton of fun. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't tell you how, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of games that I've been a part of, where uh, I had this epically awesome, amazing oh, yeah. storyline ready to roll out, and and it just gets sidetracked on this this tiny little rabbit hole of a thing that ends up being the most hilarious, fun thing we've mm-hmm. ever done. Uh, but then, you know, my 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 epic uh, uh, sprawling narrative that I was ready uh, just you know takes a, 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 a you know it takes a, a, just a side seat to that. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and the players explore, you know, some very small minutia, but, you know, it's, it's, it's all about, you know, it, film and television, especially is, is very, you know, um, uh, director driven, writer driven, creator driven in that we, we want you to, as a, as a filmmaker, we want the audience to experience 
our story. And uh, it, the, the filmmakers, the focus and the creators, the focus, the writers, the focus, mm-hmm. uh, same way with, with the novelist and in, in, you know, in, in any of those uh, sort of those passive traditional mediums. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but now you, you, you know, you were, you're seeing a mindset shift mm-hmm. in, wait a minute, like the focus isn't now on the story teller or the story creator the the focus is now on on the audience that now gets to actively create the story and and it's our job to 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 build the sandbox for them to operate in uh but but it's it's becoming more participatory in a big way and 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 you have to you have to learn to be okay when they want to do things that you don't necessarily think they should do. Uh, and, and, and that's hard because, you know, a lot of, a lot of, you know, yeah. film, film and television specifically is ego driven. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, that's a, that's a hard thing to let go of. And mm. um, because, because, you know, you, you get into these discussions of what is the role of the artist? It's like, you know, does, do, you know, do, 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 does Metallica just let the fans jump up and dictate their, dictate their playlist, <laughs> or their set list? Do they, do, do they get to, you know, play the drums uh, themselves rather than having Lars play the drums? Mm-hmm. Uh, no, there, you know, there is some sort of role for the artist, but I feel like that's changing in a way that is incorporating the audience in this new and interesting way. And, um, and people that played RPGs that they have the inside lane on, on this, on, on this whole ship because it's where we've been for 20 years. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I, you know, when I went to college, I studied screenwriting and I did guerrilla filmmaking and stuff for a while. And, yeah. and, um, uh, and, you know, you watch these interviews and you'll hear every, occasionally you'll hear like a director or writer or a, a director writer team. They'll say, well, that's not the story we wanted to tell. Sure. And, you know, you'll hear somebody say that. And um, the a game master can't do that. <laughs> right. Right. Not you're, at all. Not at all. You, you're a jerk. Right. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. the game master, you sit down at the table and say, OK, guys, you know, oh, oh, you know, you're going to go try to find this planet where your pet little space monkey came from. That's not the story I wanted to tell. Well, your, your gaming sure. group just leaves, right? <laughs> sure. Sure. And you're finished. I, you know, it, it, it's a, it's such an interesting, it's a, such an interesting difference of philosophy. My, yeah. Like my brother's a chef and um, my brother is, is convinced that, uh, you know, no one should ever put uh, mustard on a hamburger. Uh, and when you go to his restaurant and you order a hamburger, uh, he, you know, outside of a food allergy, uh, he doesn't allow you to make any changes to the hamburger. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, you know, I find that like fundamentally un-American. Uh, and I, I think that's fascist. And uh, when we argue about it all the time. And, and I remember one time I told him, I said, I said, this is my hamburger. Like I'm paying you money. It's my hamburger. And, and he said, I'll never forget. He, he said, no, no, no. Uh, just because you pay money doesn't mean it's your hamburger. It's not your hamburger. You're paying money to experience my hamburger, <laughs> and and I was like, oh my wow, wow, we see that we see the world completely different. He's like, if you want it your way, you go to Burger King, but if if you want my hamburger, you come and you pay me, but it's still my hamburger, and you're you're paying for the experience mm-hmm. of eating my hamburger, and 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 I still think it's un American, but but that's <laughs> the way that's the way filmmakers and and traditional filmmakers, uh, you know, uh, television showrunners, like there's still that mentality. And there's maybe still some like interesting, you know, yeah, I get it. Like, you know, when we go to watch a Tarantino film, Tarantino's super talented and he he has insight and understanding that that audiences may not have, which is why he's Tarantino. And so we are going there to uh, to experience the Tarantino hamburger, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but at the, but at the same time, uh, you know, they're, they're, we're, the world's changing it from participatory or uh, from being passive to now being participatory. Steve mm-hmm. Jobs was famous for uh, um, for ignoring all the focus groups of of the of the first iPhone. Uh, ninety uh, over ninety percent of people said they would never use a uh, a phone that didn't have physical buttons. Um, and, and, and Steve Jobs said, I'm not going to do what you say. You know, if Henry Ford was famous for saying, uh, uh, you know, if, if I, if I did what the people wanted, I would just have created a faster horse. Um, and so a lot of times there is a role for an innovator and a visionary and an artist and a storyteller that has skills that maybe you don't have. And so maybe you think you want to experience a story Mm -hmm. a certain way, but, but ultimately there there may be a game master that actually does have this amazing story that you just don't know that you're missing. 
Uh, and so we have to allow for that somewhere. Um, but at the same time, we, we also, as creators, have to allow for, for the audience to be able to, um, to dictate where they want to go. I think there, there's a balance somewhere that we have to find. Uh, because I think if if Metallica fans wanted to jump up there and, and and play Metallica songs themselves and dictate the the uh, the, the set list or if I, I or or hey, I'll give you one I'm 100 percent convinced that if Star Wars fans me being one somehow dictated beat by beat the next Star Wars movie it would probably be terrible <laughs> right it would probably it probably wouldn't be great it would be great in our mind but it, well ultimately it probably wouldn't be as good as if you know these super talented people like John Favreau or Dave Filoni, you know, if they were able to kind of, you know, do their thing because they are who they are because they have a skill that other people don't have. So, so I'm interested in finding that intersection What is the balance that can mm-hmm. help both worlds exist together. Yeah, absolutely. And cause I, I think, you know, I, I mean, you're absolutely right because there are times, you know, that I, I experience, you know, a, a, you know, a fantastic creator story. And I was like, I would have never went to that place. Right. I would have right. never went exactly. there. I would have never done that myself. But I and then I also think that sometimes, though, as audience members, um, we we maybe want certain things, but we don't know how to articulate those things. Right. Sure. And, Absolutely right. You know, and we you know, it takes that that great creator or that great showman or whoever it is to be like, I know what you want, you know, and here it is, but you know, I'm not taking to you to this place because you said you wanted this, but you didn't really want that. You just couldn't, you didn't have a word for it or something. Yeah. You know, you know, as a, as a writer in Hollywood, one of the, one of the, the skills that they don't teach you at all in film school or, or, you know, in any formalized way is how do how to take notes from a studio executive. And so you're working with a studio and you come up with an idea and you're writing something and, um, and, and you send it in and then they send you notes back. Um, and, and, and largely like the notes are dumb, uh, you, you know, for the most, sometimes they're, they're smart depending, but you know, a lot of times you're like, you're like, how did you, how like, th- why would you suggest this? And they'll say, no, I think this, I think this person needs, you need to switch this from a boy to a girl and you need to uh, uh, create a love interest with this and they'll make all these suggestions and they're not writers, they're executives. Uh, and, and, and you're like pounding your head against the wall. Like these people are just so dumb. And there's an art though, to learning how to read the note and, and, and the way you read the note. I had an old screenwriter mentor uh, of mine who, who taught me this is like, you don't, you don't, necessarily take the note just on face value you have to figure out why did they make that note what's the what's the what's the thing that they're craving that they don't know how to express and they express it like this because they're not writers but like but like where are they trying to get like if if they say i think this character needs a love interest maybe they're just saying there needs to be a more emotional depth to the character uh and and they they think they can achieve emotional depth depth by way of uh, but by way of a love interest or maybe they're saying they want to be able to you know balance out the testosterone with some with something that could appeal to more of a female demographic that, which widens the audience and so so now you can kind of get down to the root of the note and come up with strategies that that are actually better because you're actually the writer, and um, uh, but, but at the same time, you know, not use the dumb idea. So, so I think I think a lot of times that's how we need to listen to audiences and listen to, listen to the listen to the fan base. And uh, you know, one of the one of the you know again being the Star Wars fan, uh, this is super controversial. I loved episode uh, uh, episode eight, the Last Jedi. Uh, I, I loved it. And um, uh, which, you know, uh, man, it's like a, a, a minefield out there when you when you express your love for The Last Jedi. Uh, I didn't love everything about it. Uh, but ultimately, the reason that I loved The Last Jedi, one, I thought it was a beautiful film just visually. But the reason I love The Last Jedi is that it surprised me. And uh, I, I can't remember the last time but before that, that a Star Wars film legitimately surprised me. And, uh, and I thought, wow, okay. You know, when, when, uh, Holdo flies the ship through the, uh, through the, the, the other ship or when, when, when the, you know, uh, Kylo Ren cuts off Snoke's head, uh, you know, and, and, and hit the, the, they has the battle with Ray, uh, in the throne room. Like those are choices that I wouldn't have, I didn't expect. I'm like, wow. Okay. This is awesome. I would have never gone there myself. 
but I'm just like totally just along for the ride. Um, but, but that's really one of the reasons that I love that film is that, is that Ryan Johnson did things that, that I didn't expect. And, and what you learn as a, as a writer, professional writer is that subverting the expectation of the audience is really the key to making people happy, uh, whether they like it or not, uh, because subverting their expectation is lit is literally that means going ag going against what they they think they want, uh, but still somehow pleasing them on the other end, and it's and it's difficult to do. But uh, if everybody could do it, you know, everybody would. Uh, so it's not an easy uh, uh, plane to land. But um, but I think if if you get them to to a same or similar point in a in a in a, in a very different direction. Um, that's, that's the sweet spot of, of, of where we need to go. And I just, I just, I just, I hate it when, when, uh, when creators and writers and filmmakers and they, 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 they almost have this like scorn and disdain for their fan base. Uh, and it's, it's, it's such a bizarre thing. I, I like the musicians that hate playing their hits when they go to a show. Uh, uh, and, you know, they want to play their own, you know, their, their new stuff or whatever. And they just like listen to the fan base. I just, I, I don't understand that mentality at all. And I think it's because I was shaped as a child and a teenager and a, and a college kid. I was shaped into learning how to react to my audience, which were, who were my players in my RPG. I was trained with that. Those were my reps. And so of course, now this makes sense to, to me in, in, in the marketplace of how do I react to the audience and how do I incorporate them in? Because I was trained that way, and, and some people that 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 are more ego driven that would probably have been terrible game masters and dungeons masters. That's probably why they didn't play uh, because that you know they would have run a couple games and nobody would have come back because uh, you know you, we've all met DMs and GMs like that, right? Like that are just you know tyrannical in in, in in the way they run the games because they want you to experience their story, and um, it's just not how it works. So so I think I benefited in that way for sure. Yeah, and. Um... Um, you know, a lot of stuff there and I'd like to unpack some of it. I don't want sure. to, to derail the conversation by turning into a last Jedi rant or, or anything <laughs> like that, I know. Which, which I could, <laughs> which I could, yeah. because, um, I have a little different of opinion there. Um, I I'll just mention two points. I think the, sure. the, the, the ships, uh, I'm going to forget their names now. Um, I know the older films way better because I had more time to watch those when I was a kid. Sure. Um, but the two ships, when the, uh, the new Imperial ship and the, uh, the precursor to the rebels are kind of, you know, yep. the, uh, the, the new, the resistance, I guess are escaping. Yeah, yeah, sure. They couldn't catch each other. And then, yeah the uh, ship going into uh, hyperspace and crashing into the other. To me, that was a fundamental change in the physics of the universe. And to me, that kind of broke the fiction of the world building because um, in Star Wars and all the other movies and TV shows and cartoons, uh, ships, you know, act like act like ship, like airplanes, so, you know, atmospheric craft sure. and they can catch up to them really quickly. And then the idea um, I think the role playing game solved that idea with the um, the hyperspace because all you'd need to do then is just uh, set up a whole bunch of ships with droid pilots and you could just jump into hyperspace whenever sure. you wanted and blow up every ship. And um, I think the role playing game solved that by saying that um, that every ship had a fail safe. If something was placed in the way, it would drop out of hyperspace. And, and that's what pirates did. They would put something in you know the path of a hyperspace sure. lane and force the sure. ship just to drop out. So to me, those two big changes like broke the fiction of the world building. And I know you yeah. said you teach world building. So do, do you have an yeah. opinion on those two? I'm sure you do. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So, so uh, one, I think, uh, you know, one of the surprising things that, that I appreciate with Ryan Johnson was this, uh, this like low speed chase in space. Like that's something I don't think I've ever seen in anything before of, uh, you know, let's, you know, if, it's, it's almost like an elementary school, like word problem. If like one car is going five miles per hour and another car is, you know, a uh, uh, hundred feet behind also going five, mi five miles per hour, like, you know, will they ever catch each other? Like one of those things. It, and it, and it's, it's something that, that uh, pro was like such a ridiculously weird scenario that I, you know, it, it, it seemed, it reminded me something uh, of a, of a situation that would have occurred in one of my games I was playing, right? One of those, it, it, I, I never would have expected it being in a feature film, but, but in regard to the Holdo maneuver where, where it split that, you know, it split the, um, uh, the other ship. 
you know, I, for me, like the internal logic, but you're right. Internal logic for world building is, is huge. Right. And I mean, and, and listen, uh, I think anybody that 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 goes um, that tries to examine uh, George a uh, George Lucas world with internal logic, it's 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 bound to be disappointed because George is 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 notorious for having like immense plot holes and everything. Uh, as much as a huge, massive, like inspirational George Lucas fan, you know that I am. Uh, you know the the dude didn't have a lot of you know you know. Uh, a lot of good instinct for, for some of these things, or I guess he had a willingness to, to just kind of be a little loose with some of those rules. But for me, it goes back to, uh, I think it was, uh, I think it was a new hope when um, uh, I think it was a new hope when, when Luke is, is, is telling, um, uh, telling Han, he was like, you know, just, you know, they're getting chased and, and, and they're trying to put the nap coordinates in to, to make the hyperspace jump. And Luke is trying to get him to go like, oh, we got to go now. got to go now. And, uh, and, and Han says something like, uh, do you want to end up in the middle of a star by just you know jumping blindly into space? Mm-hmm. Um, which introduces this idea way back in the seventies is that if you just if you can go into hyperspace and then crash into something, mm-hmm. uh, which is why you need the nav computer. It's just not uh, and so so that little like you know hint of a okay you can you can crash into something in hyperspace. Therefore, how far does that play out? Right. Uh, you know, can't, does that mean you can crash into another ship? Like, I don't know that. I mean, that's up for debate. Uh, but then, but then we see it in the film. We're like, okay, they just canonize that. And does that, does that, um, impact, uh, you know, 10 other things that may, may not, may not coordinate probably, probably right. Just like everything in star Wars does. I mean, I think eventually, you know, listen, you know, I, we always had a rule in, in, in our games. I, I called it um, "if it looks good for the movie" rule, and there there were a lot of things that that would like you know wouldn't jive by the rules, wouldn't you know like oh, this is not going to work out. But like it was such a crazy idea that would like be so interesting and look so good uh, uh, that you know we would fudge the rules and let it happen for the storytelling purpose. Um, you have to be really tactical with that because again you want the internal logic of the world but i feel like that line in the early star wars movies about jumping into a star i feel like that gave ryan johnson just enough rope Mm -hmm. to say okay let's let's see that how this happened and if if there if it does create create all these other questions right Mm -hmm. of like wait a minute well why hasn't everybody you know, been just having like uh, uh, droid piloted ships, like what? And especially even this, like, why did Holdo have to then fly the ship herself? Why couldn't she just have programmed a master mech droid to be able to do that for her and save herself? There's always, you know, yeah, I totally get it. Like, I totally get it. But I don't think fundamentally it violated the, the rules of the world. I think all it did was create 10 more questions. But for me, 10 more questions that's not a bad thing. We just got to figure out how to answer, answer those other questions uh, with further storytelling, which maybe they do. And maybe they don't, I'm not sure, but yeah, I, I, it looked so good for me. It looked so good for me. Like, I, like in the theater with the yeah. sound design and the visual and, and it's, it surprised me that, and, and I could tie it back to that one line. I forgave him for that, even though it did admittedly create 10 more questions. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, I don't want to do derail the whole podcast <laughs> into a rant or, sure. or something about the, uh, about the, the last Jedi, um, because, uh, g- goodness knows, uh, enough, uh, t- I was going to say ink has been spilled, but it's computer typing <laughs> nowadays. So I, yes, don't know, right. I don't know what that's called, but enough yeah, 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 sure. enough emojis have been posted or, or enough memes have been posted to kind of cover uh, sure. a, a lot of The Last Jedi. Um, but, uh, you know, but I do just find it interesting, though, even, um, you know, uh, just thinking, you know, mentioning A New Hope as kind of opposed to some of the newer movies. And I know it, it's hard to... It's hard, you know, and maybe I'm relying on I'm also relying on like what, like 25 or no, 30 years of role playing game material that I've you know sure. absorbed. And so I have all of these other little bits in me. But like um, there does seem to be I don't know, this is a larger conversation. I don't know if I want to go there, but like you mentioned a new hope as uh, opposed to some of the newer movies. Now, you know, if you wanted to go through a new hope and find plot holes. If you want to go through with a fine tooth comb, you probably can find some, but every time, 
even to this day, like I, I just showed my kids, you know, the movies, you know, for the first time a couple of years ago. And yeah. every time I watch that at the end of the movie, I don't care. And I'm mm-hmm. cheering, right? Like I'm che- yes, like, and absolutely. I saw the movie the first time when I was like a teeny little kid in, I think it was a drive through theater, you know, a drive-in. Oh, My wow. parents went to a drive-in, you know, when I was like four yeah. years old in like, you know, 78 or whenever it was, I, I don't know when that sure. would have been, but like, um, you know, like it, it's just it's just so like, I don't know. There's just something about the storytelling. And I know you can go into all the sources yeah. of Yojimbo and the, you know, the fr- hidden fortress where he, he, he took all these things, you know, and, yeah, and sure. uh, the searchers and use all of these elements from other movies, but like, you're just cheering, right? Like they just have a different feel. And now, you know, uh, you know, Hollywood, like, I, I, I'm not going to tell Ryan Johnson how to direct a movie, right? I've, yeah, <laughs> I've, sure. tried, I've tried to make movies uh, ridiculous, you know, even to mention me and him in the same sentence of my little sure. projects that I did, um, you know, just ridiculous. So like, I'm not going to tell them how to make movies and stuff, but like, why, why do I cheer at a new hope, even watching it, you know, 40 some years later, Uh, And why don't I cheer at the end of the newer movies? Right. Like, I I don't know. There's just something there. Sure. Um, Well, yeah, there there is. And and I think, you know, a lot of that is, uh, is, is we're, you know, we're different now than than we were when we were a kid and we hold, we hold nostalgia. There's, there's a lot of things that, that I love um, and that, that I still love that when I try to look objectively at it are, are, aren't that great. Sure. You know, I, I, I grew up a huge Superman fan, love Superman and uh, all the Superman films, Superman comics. Uh, and, uh, you know, I recently went back and watched the the, the uh, Christopher Reeves Superman films and they're not great. Mm-hmm. They, they aren't, um, uh, you especially compared to modern, the modern filmmaking. Do I still love them? Of course I do. Sure. Uh, but, you know, uh, they're not great. I mean, even even, you know, uh, uh, going back and, and, and watching like episode one in and uh, I. I read the episode one script, Phantom Menace, and um, I think as a screenwriter, and I don't know if you've ever done this, but uh, uh, actually just read the script. Yeah. It may be the worst written script in the history of scripts. It, <laughs> it, it is it's absolutely terrible. And I don't know. I don't know how that happened. And I don't like it, but uh, it, it's, 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 it's awful. And George Lucas had this tremendous ability to take Natalie Portman, Samuel Jackson, and Ewan McGregor and turn them all into bad actors, which if you then go watch Black Swan, uh, and uh, then, then you see, wow, Natalie Portman is incredible. Uh, but somehow, like, it, it all happened. But listen, I still saw Phantom Menace three times when it was in the theater. I, 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 uh, I, 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 I own it today. I was just showing the podcast scene to my seven-year-old uh, daughter um, uh, a few weeks ago. I still, I still love the, I still love the movie. And, and even though it's, even though it's pretty <laughs> terrible, Attack of the Clones maybe is one of the worst movies of all time. I still love it. And, and, and it's this, it's, it's the nostalgia. It's my love of Star Wars. It's this, this brand equity that I have. And so when, when Ryan Johnson gets into it, um uh you know what like i i loved i loved force awakens i loved last jedi and i loved rise of skywalker i didn't love everything about force awakens didn't love everything about last jedi didn't love everything about rise of skywalker i think as a whole disney fumbled not not having one creator plan the whole thing they should have just gave, given it to jj abrams the whole the all the whole trilogy uh mm-hmm. because i don't think the lego blocks connected as well as they 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 wanted uh, but at the same time, I still walked away with this sense of like, okay, that's cool. Didn't love everything about him, but I, but I still loved it. For me, and, and you know this as a filmmaker, is is I try not to get into this deconstructionist mode because it's so it's such a miracle that anything ever gets made in Hollywood, and the things that do get made, it's it's such a a, a crazy process to end up with anything that you know. I, that's why I laugh at, at people that that say, oh, Spider Man had to have reshoots, or Doctor Strange movie had to have reshoots. It, like the you know, everything has reshoots. It's so hard to do anything to, like you're bright on the first try. It's like it's, it's this incredible thing. But uh, but it's like looking at like this this amazing skyscraper that is that is beautiful and this like work of human engineering and and this this feat that is like incredible. And then you you look up and you see like seven broken windows. 
mm-hmm. in this majestic skyscraper and being like, this skyscraper sucks <laughs> because there's seven broken windows. And you know, who, who put these windows in? They don't even care. That's lazy window making and lazy architecture. It's like, oh yeah, you know what? It does suck that those windows are broken and those windows shouldn't be broken. And like, it isn't perfect, but holy crap. It's like, I was, I was on a plane uh, uh, not too long ago and, and I try to think about this stuff intentionally to try to maintain perspective is, is here I am flying over the ocean in a metal tube, hundreds of miles an hour, you know, at 30,000 feet. Mm-hmm. And like, we're not dying. That's a, that's a mirror. That's, ama- that's amazing that, that humans have achieved the ability to fly in a metal tube, you know, 3000 miles and not die. Right. Like that's incredible. Right. But you, I'm sitting there next to somebody thinking about this and somebody like the Wi-Fi in the plane wasn't working. And they're like, oh, this flight sucks. Oh, I can't stand flying. Flying is awful. You know, and, and that's why I feel like like that 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 fans get just to, to some extent of like, oh, wait a minute. That like there, there's something wrong with that. Those bombs shouldn't have dropped the way they dropped in that opening scene of, 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 of the last Jedi, because, you know, bombs don't drop in space and they, they start to nitpick some of this stuff. And I'm like, dude, there's space wizards and space bears. And they like, eventually things break down. Like, but, but there's a, there's this term versimilitude, which is the willing suspension of disbelief. And if, if you can, t- if you can take me along for a ride on a story level and, and get me hooked in, I'm willing to kind of, I'm willing to look past a few things. Now, listen, there is a line where I'm like, you know, the internal logic breaks completely that I'm like, okay, I'm out. Uh, but I try to be as forgiving as, as I can. Uh, but, uh, but for me, the, the biggest problem with the, with the Star Wars, the, the new Star Wars trilogy is that the, the Lego blocks didn't fit together as well. But all is forgiven for the Mandalorian. I'll take, I'll take a couple like, su- like subpar movies with what they're doing on Disney+. Plus. Like with the Mandalorian and the new Ahsoka Tano, Tano spinoff and the upcoming Obi Wan, like they're really flexing their muscles uh, in Disney Plus, which I love and I'm grateful for. So I'll take a couple janky movies if it got me the Mandalorian. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, like I said, I don't want to derail the podcast, and I'm almost out of your time here. But I have a lot more questions to ask. But I will agree, the Mandalorian is uh, pretty much amazing. The only the only problem that I'm finding with the Mandalorian is as they add in some of the the characters and the lore from like the Clone Wars, I'm just not up on sure. some of that newer stuff. But um, it uh, yeah. it has been uh, uh, really like they nailed like almost everything on that, right? Like they nailed the soundtrack. That's kind of like the good, bad and the ugly, but in space, yeah. you know, I mean, it's just like, yeah, OK that you know it's 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 really incredible what they're doing and 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 how they're being able to pull in uh you know uh the characters from the clone wars you know with soka tano she was an animated character in the clone wars Mm -hmm. animated character in star wars rebels and then uh got pulled into to the live action mandalorian and is now getting her own show uh really is 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 this incredible uh feat of 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 storytelling that that is very difficult to do and that's actually where my my expertise lies in in this this multi-platform multi-narrative storytelling that creates sort of this macro storytelling approach of how do you how do you create and write different things and then tie them all together in a, in, 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 in some sort of cohesive way. And it's not easy at all. And to see them being able to do that, it, it's starting to, to convince me that actually uh, episodic serialized um, Star Wars is really going to be the future of Star Wars uh, more so than I, if I were them, I wouldn't put out a feature film for five years just to kind of let everybody's palate be cleansed from the, 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 the raging audience debate of, of the last Jedi and the rise of Skywalker. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I really feel like, th- like their future is, is in animation and, and TV in a big way and video games with the Jedi fallen order. And, uh, and they're just yeah. really doing a great yeah. job. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I tend to agree because everybody I talk to is like eating up the Disney plus stuff and you know, yeah. You know, and so it's just like, why not? <laughs> you know, why? Yeah, focus on that. And of course, I think too, yeah. they they really leaned into the idea that um, you can get anybody in the world to be involved with Star Wars, right? Sure, um, sure. You know, they have Robert Rodriguez directing episodes and the the greatest cast. You know, I mean, you know, and of course, you get some nods back to some really cool stuff. You know, you get Michael Behan from you know the Terminator and some of the great the James Cameron films. You know, he he shows sure. up. Like you can just get anybody. You can just 
get anybody. Yeah. And I think they're really leaning into that. Um, and so that really does, you know, that, that really lends itself to the medium because you can get those people to work for a couple of weeks instead of, you know, or instead of, you know, tying them up for a huge feature film or something like that. Um, Ab- the- absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And now, you know, I did want to, you know, ask a couple of things I wanted to ask kind of for you to, to define transmedia sure. and how small creators can kind of do some of that. And I don't want to take up your time. So if you need to go, I totally get it. But um, no, no, I, I'm fine with going into overtime. I don't mind. OK, cool. So maybe just define transmedia for us. I introduced you as a transmedia author. Uh, that was kind of a new concept for me over the last maybe like two years. And then I totally yeah. misunderstood it when I first heard about it. So why don't you define that? Yeah. So transmedia is the art of uh, cross-platform storytelling. So it's the art of uh, using multiple mediums and multiple platforms uh, to tell different stories that all work together for a greater whole. And uh, so it's not just, it's it, it's different than single channel storytelling. So you're not just, you know, making movies, you're not just writing books, you're not just making video games. Uh, now it's about how do I make a movie that tells one story and write a book that tells a different story and create a game that tells a different story but they all link together in sort of a broader whole. And you see, when I got into Hollywood, uh, you know, I, I got into Hollywood, a child of, of the eighties and nineties where, um, you know, I grew up on, uh, on multi-platform stuff, you know, it's, uh, it's you know, Star Wars, uh, GI Joe, um, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and I, I, He Man. I, I was used to existing with the cartoons and the comic books and the films and TV shows. I, I, I was used to that, and so when I got into Hollywood, I wanted to create those that which I was a fan, and uh, uh, and and I wanted to figure out how to crack that nut. And it was really super difficult, and that 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 led me to to really exploring the discipline of um, of, of the sort of this macro cross-platform storytelling. And I realized that it, it actually is a, a very different discipline than um, uh, th- than just, you know, single channel storytelling, just being a filmmaker, screenwriter, things like that. It's just a different skill set. And uh, I went through, there wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of uh, uh, literature about it and there wasn't a lot of training about it. And so I went on about a two-year research project, uh, forensically auditing uh, all great multi-platform uh, franchises that, that 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 I grew up with, you know everything. You know, like I said, from from He Man and GI Joe, all the way up to the, the current stuff of uh, uh, you know Harry Potter and things like that. And 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 I was looking at okay, what were all the what were all the creative decisions that that all these things had in common, and uh, what what you know what what were the business decisions that they had in common? How did they position this stuff and how did they build their, their story worlds the, the right way? And, um, uh, or similarly, and I started to see patterns. I, you know, everything from, from, from He-Man to, to Marvel, to Star Wars, uh, to even Pokemon, things like that. I started to see, Oh, okay. These like eight things, they, all these things did creatively. They all approached, uh, even though they're wildly different genres and, and different mediums and platforms at play, they still built their IP using say these eight very specific strategies. And so uh, and I kind of saw the matrix uh, matrix is another good example of it. Uh, <laughs> I saw the matrix in that way. And um, that led me to, uh, to realizing there wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of professional resources that would help people uh, uh, intentionally do this. Some people just had good, good instincts, George Lucas, uh, uh, J.K. Rowling, they, you know, they, they just had good instincts of how to do this, but there wasn't a you know a, a lot of literature or training for people to figure out how to do this intentionally and kind of stand on those those shoulders in a, in a big way. And so, um, uh, so I I, it ended, I ended up writing and publishing a book uh, um, you know, several years ago called "Make Your Story Really Stink and Big." Published it through Michael Weesey, and it was the first book on the market that really gave a path forward for creators to say, "Okay, it's okay." To want to create something like Star Wars and uh, and 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 have it be multiple things that all work together for a greater for a greater whole, or something like Marvel, or something like you know whatever, and um, uh, and 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 I released it and and, and that did really well. Uh, and it was cool because it's probably two weeks after I released it, I got a call from uh, Dave Voss, who is the senior VP of product and design at uh, Mattel. And Mattel brought me in and said, "Hey, we're we're working on this this property, Monster High. We want it to be all this stuff, but like the story is not working out." Like, and 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 I worked with them on on how to optimize Monster High for for, for cross platform transmediated 
you know, release and, and all these other projects. And, and, and that just kind of got me into this world of like, okay, there's actually a craft here. And I learned from, you know, a, a couple of people in the space, you know, a guy named Jeff Gomez, Henry Jenkins, that were, they really sort of even, you know, ahead of me, uh, uh, blazed the, you know, that trail. Um, but, uh, uh, and then since, you know, I think two, two, three years ago, uh, published my current book called, you're going to need a bigger story. And, um, that is even sort of an expanded version of the first. And, and because now, since I wrote that first book, there's been this huge, massive explosion of transmediated properties, um, you know, really driven by comics and video games in a big way. And, um, and it's been, it's been amazing. We've seen, we've seen the resurgence of Star Wars. What Marvel's done with the MCU is absolutely incredible. We're seeing, you know, uh, Lord of the Rings, a new resurgence of that based on what Amazon is doing with the new, with the new series and the, the MMO, uh, you know, with, with, with Halo and Pokemon and, you know, uh, uh, the Wheel of Time series is now on Amazon. Um, I don't know if you've watched Arcane yet on, on, uh, on Netflix. No. Arcane is absolute. Oh man. Uh, man uh, like Arcane is absolutely incredible. It's set inside the League of Legends universe. Okay. Absolutely amazing animated series. Highly recommend it. But like what we're seeing with the Witcher and I could just go on and on. It's just like this massive move into how do you take a story and not have it just be one thing? How, how do we have it be lots of things that work together as a way to kind of build a, a, a broader, cohesive brand to, to the size of, you know, something like Star Wars. But, but, you know, I think to your point or to your question was how to, how to sort of mere mortals that aren't George Lucas and JK Rowling, how do, how do we take advantage of uh, something like that when we don't have a $200 million budget? Mm -hmm. And I, I think the same principles apply. It's, it's what are you creating content with and how are you creating content and, and how do you link these things together? And so it may not be a feature film, a, a, a comic book series um, and, um, you know, a TV series or animated TV series, it, but it may be a narrative podcast, a series of short stories, uh, a tie in website and a self-published novel. Uh, but the, the same principles apply. Is, is you have to have a great narrative universe and a cohesive story world narrative universe where all these things uh, operate in with internal logic that impacts them all. Um, you have to figure out how to not tell the same story over and over again, but tell different stories that impact uh, those stories. And um, you know, it's, it's what I call the, 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 law, the narrative laws or laws of, of storytelling where, um, where we can look up in the sky and we see a 757 airplane flying through the sky and, and, and we see, wow, that's awesome that that plane is flying through the sky. Um, I could never uh, have a plane like that fly through the sky because I don't have, you know, $200 million to build a plane like that or however much it costs to build a plane. But what that airplane is doing is it's using the law of lift to supersede the law of gravity. And it's tapping into laws that, that are available to, to everybody. But it's, it, that's how airplanes fly. Use the law of lift to supersede the law of gravity. You need them both to make the airplane go. Um, so, so even though I don't have two hundred million dollars to build that airplane, I can still fold up a sheet of paper in a specific way and throw a paper airplane across the room, and that paper airplane uses the law of lift to supersede the law of gravity. It's the exact same laws at work in the paper airplane and the seven fifty seven. There's just a difference in scale, and so, so for so for me, I I, I approach self-published novel, podcast, TikTok videos with the same principles and mentality, mentality that Lucasfilm and their story group would, would approach animated series, uh, live action series, and feature film. Um, it, 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 it's all the same laws. And, and, and the more you get in tune with those principles, the more you figure out how to scale them down to the platforms that are available to, to sort of the normal people that don't have the zillion dollar studio budgets, budgets behind them. Yeah, and definitely I wanted to ask about that because obviously, um, you know, you, you talk about Star Wars, obviously, uh, what a 40 some year history of the IP. Yeah. I'm I'm a fan, so I'm definitely taking my kids to see the movie. You know, my wife's a fan, right? Like, I mean, we're all fans. Yeah, it's true. And, um, yeah. Marvel, right? What is it? 60 years of comic book kind of fandom, sure. you know, built up yeah. in there. Um, and I guess I'm just, you know, kind of wondering, um, you know, say like, you know, I release my you know, my small little role-playing game, or I, I you know, I, I put out a novel, you know, uh, in June of 2021 and I've created this world, but it's just like, um, you know, 
then thinking about kind of some of these different platforms, right? Like, um, I don't know. I'm just always caught between like, how do I determine which ones are the best platforms to kind of like lean into, right? And, sure. and attack um, um, to kind of build, you know, that audience there. But then sure. is it even like, is it even in the realm of possibilities uh, to get, say, like a Netflix animated show or something like that based around one of my creations because it just seems like we're getting so many remakes and reboots of, yeah. you know, properties that, you know, I mean, TV shows that had like one season sure. in the 70s and was canceled because of bad ratings gets a reboot feature film, right? Like, sure, you know, sure. You know, you know so how, how do we kind of navigate that? Because, I mean, we only have so much bandwidth kind of personally. It's like, yeah. I, I can't have, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, inst- you know, um, you know, f- you know, Wattpad and, you know, and all sure. of these things kind of going all at one time or, or, or should I try to get those things going at one time? I, I, I don't know. It's yeah, just, I mean, it's very, it, it seems overwhelming sometimes. I think it does. It, it does. I, I think I, 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 I'm empathetic to that. I'm going to answer your last question first was uh, about Netflix is, is, is it's not just the Netflix problem is the reason we see the uh, reboots isn't because we have people that love the source material. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, hardly anything like I, I really probably less than 5% of the things that you see in film and television are completely original ideas that didn't start as a, previous TV show, previous movie, or a book that was published somewhere, or uh, uh, a uh, uh, comic book or something. Like at like 95% of things are, are adaptations. Even the things that you think are completely original aren't. They're based on some some book that was somewhere. And, um, and the reason that uh, we see reboots and, and things that are, that, are, that are based on books and things like that, and, and less just like originally conceived ideas, is because uh, there's so much money at stake that no one wants to lose their jobs by taking on, uh, by betting on a horse that hasn't been proven yet. And you have to understand that all of Hollywood is is built with with hundreds of middle managers that are these studio executives that that determine you know what you know what get ma- what gets made and what doesn't. And they're not making their their decisions based on the artistic uh, progression of 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 the, the of the industry. They're making their decisions on how do I not get fired with this next decision that I have to make? Uh, because you have to understand they have nice six figure sal- salaries. They have, um, you know, kids in private school. They, they have a mortgage. They have car payments. They live in a gated community. And, and, and their whole focus is how do I make the next decision that I have to make? And, and how does that decision help maintain my job status to help? fund all these other things that I have in my life. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, so it, 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 they're all decisions made defensively, right? That, uh, uh, and, and, and so what they do is they revert to the safe decisions. So right now, if, if, if I was a studio executive and, and I had two scripts in front of me, one was um, this really cool, completely original, uh, interesting, progressive, edgy script that, that you know, dared to push the boundaries of storytelling in a lot of interesting, amazing ways. And then the other script is the reboot, the feature film reboot of the Brady Bunch, starring Vince Vaughn as Greg Brady. Uh, if, and that was like solidly mediocre. If I had those two in front of me in a vacuum, of course, I would green light the, the, the progressive, interesting, edgy script. Of course I would. But in the real world, 100 times out of 100, I green light the Brady Bunch. Not because I think the Brady Bunch is better. It's just the Brady Bunch is safer. For me, because if I if I greenlight the progressive script uh, and it flops, right, so, like, and I lose fifty million dollars of somebody else's money, mm-hmm. somebody's getting fired, and then an executive changeover in the industry is, is 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 massive, and it's a crazy thing. And so, because you can't lose fifty million dollars of somebody else's money too many times before they just you know don't let you make those decisions anymore, right? That you get fired. And so if I'm the one that take, if I, if, I, if I took the bet on the executive level, on the progressive script, and it doesn't work, then my job could be at risk, which means my house is at risk, which means my kid's private school tuition is at risk. But if I make the Brady Bunch and greenlight the Brady Bunch, and it bombs and flops, like, of course, it probably will, um, then all of a sudden, it's not my fault. 
I made the safe decision because everybody knows the Brady Bunch. And that and, and the, the Brady Bunch has massive brand awareness and, and, and it has a pre-established fan base. So all of a sudden, it's not my fault. It's Vince Vaughn's fault. It's it's the director's fault. It's somebody else's fault. I the get to keep my job. Is yeah, it's some it's somebody else's fault, not not mine. And uh, and, and because I made the safe bet. So so mm-hmm. you have to then re you have to you have to reverse engineer that thinking as a creator to say wait a minute. Well, so so what made you feel that the Brady Bunch was a safer bet? It was pre-established audience. Mm-hmm. The the risk analysis of what gets investment, what doesn't, what gets greenlit, what doesn't, it, it, the risk investment is shifted by one thing, and that is by audience pre-awareness, what they call pre-awareness. Is there brand awareness? Is, are, is there some sort of established fan base? If there is established fan base, we're, we're game, right? Now, here's the punchline, is it do, like, they don't care where the pre-awareness comes from. They don't care like where the fans come from. They just want there to be some sort of brand awareness and some sort of fans. And so always before, the only way pre-awareness and brand awareness could exist was have it be a successful book, have it be a successful comic book, things like that. Uh, But now you're seeing brand awareness being established through things like TikTok and Webtoon and Wattpad and, um, uh, you know, Instagram and self-publish uh, the, the self-publishing industry and all these different things that can, that can, you know, podcasts is a huge one. And I mean, I, the, right now, the, the, the most option thing in Hollywood right now isn't spec scripts. They're, uh, they're podcasts that they're flipping into, into film and television apps are getting called up to for film and television just because the, you know, the, like the, uh, the calm app, if you're not familiar with the calm apps, it's been a top 10 app in, in the app store and it's a meditation app. It's being turned into a TV show at, at HBO Max that like, and it's just a meditation app. How are they going to turn it into a TV show? I don't know. Like, like, but it's, it's what they care about isn't the show. They care about the audience and how do I then convert that audience into HBO Max subscriptions? And that's it. So here's the cool, here's the cool thing is that right now, there are more platforms available to everybody through this democratization of technology that all of us can figure out how to use to generate our own audience. Always before you had to go through gatekeepers and middlemen and, you know, there were 15 guys who, who controlled, you know, every aspect of the industry from film and television, publishing, everything they had to work through them. And it was all corrupt and stupid and normal people couldn't do it. But now it doesn't matter if you can be in the middle of Iowa and if you can generate a TikTok following, all of a sudden you can sell a script a lot faster than the screenwriter who's been in Hollywood for 10 years slaving away just simply because the TikTok following is, 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 is huge. And that's infuriating to, to creators, right? Because, because like Logan Paul could go, could go get a record deal right now, you know, before, you know, a, a, a thousand other well deserved, more de- deserving artists, but and that's infuriating until you realize. Wait a minute, how did Logan Paul get famous? Well, he got famous through YouTube. That means YouTube's available for everybody. So now the game is for creators: how do I create my own audience? Right? How do I just get some traction and some audience? And how do I create a little bit of a branded ecosystem out there that 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 can? generate my own fan base and my own brand awareness. So now the brand of the IP has been established in the marketplace and there's fans, even if it's 10,000 fans, like that, then, then that's something. And, and all of a sudden, even if you have 10,000 fans, you are light years ahead of selling a major film and television script than somebody who's written a script and just not established anything in the market. And so, so go back, go back to your original question of uh you know of of where do i start with this the first thing that the first place i would i always tell people to start is what are you good at like well, like what like what like what are your what's your skill set right and so you know are are you a writer are you uh you know uh are you uh are you a tech person do you know how to build websites do you know how to build an app like like what what, what are your skill sets and 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 at first let's leverage those so i was talking to a filmmaker in new york city um uh, not too long ago and, and um, she, she asked me the same question. She's an indie filmmaker. She's like, I want to do transmedia, but I don't want to learn how to like, you know, make a podcast and all this stuff. It seems hard. Um, and, and I said, uh, I said, great. What are you good at? And she said, well, 
I'm a painter and I write poetry. I said, awesome. Let's start there. So every movie you ever make for the rest of your life, you need to make the movie, create a series of paintings that extend the story of the movie in a valuable way and do a pop-up art exhibit in New York City uh, around the release of the movie, write a series of poems that you self-publish as a book of poetry on Amazon that extend the story of the movie and the paintings both, right? And then put that put that on Amazon, sell it, you know, sell it phys- physically if you want. Um, and, and, and then you have the movie. And then all of a sudden, what that does is people will go see the movie and people who like the movie will want an extended experience if they want more of the, the story that they just, they just, you know, loved. So all of a sudden they can get that extended experience through the paintings and the poetry. Or, or then uh, people that haven't seen the movie may just be fans of poetry, come upon the book of poetry and then get intrigued by the story that you're telling through the poetry and then are led back to the movie and then are led back to the paintings. And then there are people that'll find the paintings, never heard of the poetry or the movie that will then be led to the movie and then ultimately led to the poetry. And you create a little bit of a branded ecosystem there. And if you can aggregate that whole audience together, then all of a sudden you have a, you have a core fan base that you've generated across three different platforms in a tiny little transmedia project using the principles of Star Wars without ever going outside of your own skill set, right? And different people have different skill sets. I was talking to a video game producer uh, about this and, and, he, and I said, what are you good at? And he said, well, I, I make, he makes mobile games. He said, I make mobile games, uh, but I also produce music and I, I know how to do a website uh, because I used to be a graphic designer on the side. And uh, I said, great, every single game you ever make for the rest of your life, have a tie-in website that extends the story of the game and have a concept album, maybe an EP, three or four songs that extend the story of the game and have those all out, out, out at the same time. And all of a sudden it creates a little branded ecosystem. People have never played the game, they just will in, in, be introduced to the music and then you flow them back to the game. People that play the game flow to the music, to the website, and, and it kind of feeds itself that way. Um, and so that's the f- first place I always start. What are you good at? Let's figure out how to maximize that first. Then what happens when you're tapped out? Because like you said, there's band. Everybody has bandwidth, right? Um, that's when you then pull in collaborators. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm just completely convinced that uh, it's very difficult to to launch lo- uh, ambitious large scale IP without some sort of without partnerships in different in different areas, right? So right now I'm working on a, on, on this really super ambitious big project, and I pulled in um, th- three three people. Uh, people that uh, that I knew how that uh, some people know how to um, you know filmmakers uh, um, uh, but also mu- uh, music producers uh, app developers and I just I, I, I I'm working with them to create different aspects of the IP because I can't do it all myself and so um, uh, in the own and they and they they benefit from that because they participate in the whole and so once you tap your own your own skills, then, then create a, uh, another circle, sort of the outside circle of that is start finding networking partners and, and collaborators and uh, people to help you produce it. And, and if you just do both of those, then it's, it's amazing what you can find. And then the third, like a third circle, even outside that is like, you know, go to, go to something like Fiverr. Right. And, and, and it's amazing. Like, like you go to Fiverr or Upwork or one of those things or Odesk and like, you know, uh, uh, how do I, you know, I need somebody that to, to, to do, you know, um, an anime, anime animation of this short film thing. And, you know, you'll find people that, that it can do a pretty good job for 500 bucks because they live in, in Estonia where $500 American goes a long way, but they still do good work. And all of a sudden now you, you, you freelance a, a component out that you couldn't do yourself. You didn't know anybody yourself that you could pull in. But now you've gotten that for a relatively inexpensive cost, and so, so I would look at the look at yourself, look at uh, uh, potential creative partners that you could pull into the project, and then you know, with the miracle that is the internet, how do I find people that can freelance some stuff for me in order to get me to where I'm going? But uh, but 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 look at looking at things that have good organic reach, uh, you know, podcasts, TikTok videos, things like that. Like you know, uh, a webtoon super popular right now um, as well. Uh, that helps you kind of super fuel this fan base using the same principles of Star Wars. Okay. 
Right. No, that that was fantastic, and that's a lot of information there. And it was, yeah. and and thank you because these are the questions that I ask in the guise of helping my audience when I'm just going to take notes, <laughs> try to do this with my stuff. Um, but no, I'm sure, sure it, it helped a lot of people because a lot of people that uh, listen to the podcast self publish. I mean, we all self publish yeah. our role playing game stuff, and I urge anybody who you know if you're if you're running a game. And you're making up material for your friends. I urge everybody to publish it because it's free. Yeah. <laughs> you can just put it yeah. in a PDF and publish it. Um, so you get a little of that time back because we're all uh, pressed for time these days. And if you're creating something, you might as well just put it out there. And so Absolutely. I do find, you know, and I, I found a lot of your, you know, your advice there really interesting. I guess the one big question, and I'll try to cut this short. So I, I know I'm, we've gone way over, but um, uh how how do I I guess when I release my you know my role playing game Realms of Understreet or whatever and it's about it's fantasy kingdoms of rats that live under Manhattan Island modern day Manhattan Island and so I put that out there how do I know you know if I'm going to invest in this what should I look for to tell me hey this this property has legs or this is a bust is there any kind of you know hallmarks or flags from kind of working with big ip that's just like hey yeah this one's going to last or no this one's a dud yeah the first thing that i look for is uh is you know, how great is the story world again go back to the to to rpg land and uh um you you're looking at the world and and not necessarily a singular character, not even a singular narrative, just how good is the world? Because that world's going to be the engine that produces uh, more and more um, uh, stories for you across platform over time. So you have to have that world uh, be a great world. And the way that you can tell you have a great world, one, there's a there's 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 a lot of world building mechanics that, that we could go into. But 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 the, 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 the rule of thumb that I use is you want to ask yourself, can you remove your main character? And uh, and still have something interesting left over. Can you remove even your main story and your and your core key story and still have something um, interesting left over? And you know, and if so, then you have a pretty good story world. So, can you remove Frodo from Middle Earth? Absolutely. Uh, and Middle Earth is still cool. Can you remove Batman from Gotham City and have Gotham City still be cool? Absolutely. Right? Can you remove Rocky from Rocky? Oh, that's a little harder, yeah. right? Like that feels different, right? Mm -hmm. Because because Rocky was built around the character, not the world. And so, um, you know, it, it, is, is it possible to remove uh, Sherlock Holmes from Sherlock Holmes or were possible to remove uh, uh, James Bond from James Bond? Oh, I don't know. Those, those are tough. The brand is built around the character and not really world-driven properties. Now, ultimately, you have to have great stories of, uh, as well. And, and, and so I'm not, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very much an advocate for, for great storytelling because you need to have good product. But, but you need to have a great story world. And if, the more you invest into the development of the story world, and you just have to have a good idea. Like, what's the, what's the idea? Like, you told me the, you, you told me an idea like your idea right there was like, you know, this underground round, uh, kingdom of rats underneath, uh, uh, under Manhattan. It's a good idea. And, and, and I think a lot of people, a lot of people skirt past just really landing on a good idea. They want to try to execute a mediocre idea in a great way, mm -hmm. uh, thinking that their storytelling can elevate like the, the core idea and say, I come from, uh, Kentucky and in Kentucky, um, uh, you call that putting lipstick on a pig. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how much makeup you put on a pig. It's still going to be a pig at the end of the day. And so I really, I really encourage people take the time to come up with an idea for your story world an idea for the IP, not just the story that gets people to say, Ooh, that's cool. Yeah, it, it, you know, one thing that I, that I, I really appreciate about, about the line that the, the idea that you just told me was that you were effectively able to deliver it, you know, in, 15 seconds. And that is, a, a, and still for me to, to understand kind of what the, the concept of the world is. And, and that's a, that's an earmark that I look for. That, that's an indicator. If you can't, if you can't explain the hook of your world in 10 to 15 seconds, you haven't nailed it, right? If it takes you 10 minutes to explain what your, why your world's cool, you haven't nailed it. It's, it, you need to have a commercial idea that is punchy and quick and, 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 and rooted in irony in some way. Um, and intriguing. And once you have that, once you build that story world out in a very practical sense, um, then all of a sudden now you have you, you, you have the engine that can really drive 
great storytelling across platform in a really good way. And and one thing that's, that's interesting, I want to take this completely full, full circle, is uh, uh, in, in my last book, uh, You're Going to Need a Bigger Story, um, there's a world building mechanic that I think is one of the most practical world building mechanics that, that, that I've, I've come across. Uh, and it's, um, uh, it, it's, it's, I, I use when I develop worlds, I use the character alignment chart from D and D, uh, where you, you find out, you know, am I chaotic neutral? Am I, you know, uh, like, like that, that, that whole chart that I'm sure everybody has listened to the, the pro, uh, the, to the, uh, to the podcast understands. What I do is I make that into a matrix of nine boxes, and then I create a group of characters that live in my world in in every single box, and 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 so I, I when I'm populating my world, I'm populating my world with nine very specific groups that are all ideologically different, and you know your chaotic evil group is going to be very different than even your chaotic uh, neutral group or your chaotic good group, uh, they're all going to be very different. Um, and, or your lawful evil and your chaotic evil is going to be very different. And those two groups all, all live in that same world. And, um, and that's something that I, that I pulled from, from D and D of like, of ind- not just doing individual characters, but I populate my entire story world through a paradigm of uh of 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 dnd's character alignment chart and i actually had the opportunity to um uh to talk to a guy named flint dilly and flint dilly actually uh you developed the the uh, the dungeons and dragons source book for gary gygax, gygax back in the 70s and um and i actually i spoke at the same conference as him and then we shared a plane ride together on the way back to la and um and he used the character alignment chart when he was developing the original Transformers universe, um, just working with individual characters. I even elevated it even more than that by saying groups of characters develop it in all nine boxes. Uh, but it's cool. But from like Flint Dilly to myself, like we, we're all using, we're using <laughs> old school RPG mechanics to, to fuel multi-platform world building, which is which is super cool. So, um, yeah. but, but yeah, focus on that story world and everything becomes a lot easier. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, of course, I mean, a number of things there too. I, I interviewed Robert Hewitt Wolf, who is a, you know, television producer known for Star Trek, Deep Space Nine, Gene Roddenberry's Andromeda yeah. was on, uh, what elementary he was the executive producer for that for a long time and yep. he talked about the using you know chaotic neutral and chaotic good and stuff like that as well sometimes <laughs> so yeah. that's that's just yeah. funny uh to hear sure. that um but yeah and i really liked what you had to say there about like if your world is you know basically if your world makes a good role-playing game you're probably yes. set um and i always thought that that was true because there were certain there were certain things like, you know, certain properties, you know, when I was a kid in the eighties, you know, you watch the movie Tron, you're like, that's yeah. a role-playing game because yeah, it is. I want to go into a computer, right? Like I, that's what I yep. want to do. Um, Dark Crystal. You're like, that's a good role-playing sure. game. Um, yep. And you can just go down and like Transformers. I, I, I don't even yep. know if there's a Transformers role-playing game. Why wouldn't there be a Transformers role-playing game? Right. Because you can <laughs> right. fit it into that. Yeah, there should be. You can totally fit into that world and make any kind of Autobot or Decepticon that you want. And so, you know, but like I said, I'm not going to keep you on here all day. I I could uh, because I have a lot more questions, but just why don't you uh, let uh, the audience know where can people learn more about you? uh, Where can they find your books or, you know, some of the projects that you're working on so they can learn more about you and transmedia? Sure. So uh, you can go to my website, superstory.works, W-O-R-K-S. So superstory.works. That's where I house, uh, it's me and my company, and it's where we have uh, all of our stuff. So you can, you can find me uh, through that website. Um, you can also find my, uh, my book, uh, You're Going to Need a Bigger Story. Uh, you can find that on Amazon. You can also find it on, uh, on the website just by, um, uh, or go to Amazon, just type in my name, they, they, they pop up. So, uh, so yeah, like, like, and honestly, some of the people that benefit most from my book that is really written for, you know, primarily film and television people. Uh, I find uh, game masters and dungeon masters really buy a lot of these books uh, because, you know, it helps them uh, fuel their, um, you know, fuel their games and build the worlds that they have for their games. And so, uh, so it, it's pretty cool, but yeah, you can find me there. Uh, you know, I'm on, on all the social media platforms as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm right now consulting a lot of, 
projects that are that are super cool. They're under under NDAs. But one thing that I'm developing right now that I hope to to, to uh, start seeding the marketplace in uh, the middle of next year will be um, this thing that I'm, I'm we're calling the Light Striker Saga, and it's going it's 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 probably the most ambitious world building I've ever done. And, um, and, and, and we're really excited about it. It's going to be podcast. It's going to be music. It's going to be, um, uh, film and television. It's going to be, um, uh, self-published novels, uh, that, that are, we're going to actually release first. Uh, so, um, so I'm super excited about that. And, uh, you know, um, and as a way to test that again, to test that world, I've been, I've been running, running RPGs. And so I'm really, really, really looking forward to developing an RPG, um, uh, in that world as well. And, 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 you know, getting that out to the marketplace and, and seeing how people like it. So that's, that's, that's where they can find me. And that's what I've been working on. Awesome. And I will be sure to put links in the show notes for this episode at dicegeeks.com. So anybody who is listening right now, you can head over there and you will find links uh, to Houston's website and and what he is up to and his social media and all that. Houston, it has been um, awesome having you on the show. Some great insights. Um, maybe we should just do one where we just rant about Last Jedi or something. <laughs> we, could, we could fill in like five hours just on that one <laughs> but anyway it. it has been a pleasure uh speaking with you and thank you so much for coming on the show today thank you i had a good, great time all right there you go guys i really hope you enjoyed my conversation with houston today oh my goodness it was just such a pleasure to get to speak with him and to ask him questions about kind of really the future of storytelling and where this is all going and it is awesome to know that a person working in Hollywood uh, used to play the Star Wars West End games. Well, not used to play. He still does play the West End Star Wars game, which is awesome. So as I mentioned, I have put links in the show notes for this episode. You can go to DiceGeeks.com. Check those out, please. Houston's work with stories and transmedia and how storytelling is becoming more and more interactive and participatory is fascinating. So I think you will enjoy it. I know I find it incredible. I also find it interesting that how it seems like everything's becoming a tabletop role-playing game. <laughs> Movies, TV shows, all of that. Yeah. VR. We're going to be, we're going to be living in a tabletop role-playing game, I think at some point. Uh, but anyway, guys, Check out those show notes. Learn about Houston's work. Now, if you want some free stuff, head over to DiceGeeks.com slash free. You get 10 free dungeon maps. You'll get a custom background for 5e. You'll never miss an episode of this show. And each and every Friday, you'll get an email update from me letting you know what is going on in the wild world of Dice Geeks. All right, guys. Um, I just thank you so much for listening. Um, I know this was a longer episode, but man, we had a lot to talk about. I thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in each Wednesday to hear me talk about role-playing games and listen to some of my fabulous guests just talk about where story is going and the future of writing and the future of media is just all fascinating stuff. So thank you so much. And until next Wednesday, keep gaming!